On this episode of Moss Coppers, the guys take a road trip from Portland, Oregon to San Francisco, California in order to attend Sheikh Yasser Qadi's class discussing God, religion, and politics. While there, they run into Ustada Yasmin Mujahid and an ex-con turned social worker living out of his van. Stay tuned for more. All right, boys and girls, we started our trip yesterday, Thursday at about 4 p.m. For 5 p.m. we drove till 4 a.m. We reached the Golden Gate Bridge, found a campsite, set up tent, slept till about 10 a.m. and it's time to explore the city now. You want to eventually wake up and check out San Francisco? Yeah, in like five minutes. All right, that sounds good. Yo, Sharif, plan on waking up too? Yes. Okay. Can you believe millennials nowadays, man? We're in a, we're in a tent, and this idiot is texting. Hey, man, I'm texting our And host. look what this guy's eating for breakfast, like. The state of the world, man. <laughs> hey, man, this is what happens when you're eating halal. I saw, I found like a huge bag of jerky last night. Couldn't eat it. Hmm. <laughs> Dude, we picked a sweet spot to camp, man. Look at this meadow. Dude, you can totally see the uh, Golden Gate from our campsite, man. Check this out. Right? Roll up at 4 a.m. Tell you what that dude's problem is. He watches too much anime, man. Thinks he's Naruto or something. Gorgeous, absolutely beautiful, I gotta say. Amazing. Can't, can't believe we made it. Al Maghrib Institute was founded by a group of Al Madina University graduates. The aim of the organization is to provide Islamic knowledge and scholarship in an easy format held over the course of a weekend. Some of the more famous scholars such as Sheikh Yasser Qadi and Sheikh Kamal al-Makki travel across America and internationally, providing the people with an opportunity to learn from a scholar face to face. How do you think Al-Maghrib has helped the American Muslim community? I think that Al-Maghrib um is, is, is providing a platform where we can take our Islamic ideals um, and make it relevant and make it accessible. Um, one of the things that I really like about Al Maghrib and you know uh, other other institutions that are really making Islam something relevant and uh, practical because I think one of the problems that for so long and in, and still in many parts of the world Islam is something so separate 
than everyday life. It's like it's like it, it's become so ritualized. You know, it's something we do on Friday at Juma, but then when I'm at work, it's something you know that's separate than my Dean. Um, the way I interact with my family, the way that that Islam is holistic and it's relevant. So I think it's very important that we have a platform where we are making Islam relevant and we are making Islam accessible um, and something practical that we can actually live, not just concepts, not just um, something that we read in books. Can you share with us one of the more inspiring moments you've had while teaching, a student you've helped or somebody whose life you've helped to change or you've seen change throughout Maghreb or through something you've been teaching? I think that the most rewarding thing for me is when someone comes up to you and says, you know, I was going through this hardship or I was going through this loss and your class helped me or your words helped me or the, your book helped me. Um, there was one sister who came up to me and she said um, that she had lost her husband and she said that what helped her get through the grieving process was, you know, my work and subhanAllah that 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 was just like one example of something that it just is very rewarding to be able to help people in that way you know to be able to connect to people touch people and then help people heal because subhanAllah we all have um, we all need help you know in different aspects and so being an, being a, a tool in that is really really rewarding what advice would you have for any Muslim sisters who are trying to create positive change in our Muslim community the advice I'd give to Muslim sisters trying to give, create positive change is the advice I'd give to anyone. And, and that's the Quranic advice for change. Inna Allah la yughayru ma biqawmin hatta yughayru ma biinfusim. That, um, that Allah doesn't change the condition of a people unless they change what's inside themselves. And so if we want to change our environment, we want to change our condition um, either individually or collectively, we need to work on changing ourselves internally. And um, let me just add to that, that uh, the internal change is, is, um, goes hand in hand with making a difference or w basically working externally as well. So we, we have to do both activism and, um, and uh, teskiyah, which is like purification and terbiya and you know, raising and developing. Per so personal development is necessary as well as activism and, um, and uh, you know, working for social justice and um, justice in general. So both actually go hand in hand. I've been attending Al Maghrib classes since 2004. So 2004 so is about, I would say this is about 11, 11, 12 years now. I have been attending Al Maghrib classes since 05 actually. First class I ever attended was Fiqh of Love taught by Sheikh Yasir Brajas. The first interest, to be quite quite frank, uh, w uh, you know, as a as a young-blooded uh, college student, when it's your thick of love, it's gonna intrigue you, right? I mean, I think anybody uh, at that time would feel that way. Um, it's an intriguing topic. Marriage and gender, the two are the two uh, hot sellers, as they say, right? So, uh, I would say that definitely contributed. In addition to the fact uh, that um, you know, as a, as a new convert to the religion, you're seeking knowledge, you're wanting some type of respected scholarship um, and a way to learn more about the deen outside of just internet sources, local masajid. Um, there's that thirst for, for just solid beneficial knowledge that I think Al Maghrib provided. So the first thing that got me interested in Al Maghrib classes was a very interesting story. So in our community in Indiana, we, a uh, very small community, we were having differences among ourselves on different fiqh issues. So one of the students who had gone to classes in Virginia when Al Maghrib was much smaller and only in four cities, he said there's a sheikh by the name of Sheikh Yasser Burjas and he's teaching this class called Evolution of Fiqh. I bet we can resolve all our fiqh differences if we just go take Evolution of Fiqh. That was the first class I attended and that was life changing for me. Off the top of my head, if I really had to narrow it down, uh, say Al Bukhari class, also very good. I like the diversity uh, of topics in that class because it's, you're reading about multiple hadith. Um, it doesn't stick to one topic like most classes do. You go from an array of topics, from fiqh to the world around us, to the life of the Prophet, even to possibility of aliens existing, right? A lot of cool topics in that class discussed. 
So I would say the first thing that uh, for me personally uh, that El Maghrib impacted me with is providing me with more than just book knowledge. So what I mean by that is when I was in college I would read a lot of Islamic books. I would read different books from different shuyukh and so forth. But there is something about learning directly from a teacher and seeing their manners and seeing their adab and then seeing the way they interact and how they deal with issues that has more impact than just reading the book alone and getting that information theoretically. I got to see the manners of Sheikh Yasser Bajaz himself and the way he discussed differences versus the way people who are maybe not shuyukh discuss differences or maybe the way um, books would discuss differences. It was the language was uh, it was more friendly, it was more open and in turn that had an impact on me and it made me more tolerant, more open and eventually um, I would say a more uh, a more caring uh, Muslim towards other Muslims as well that I had differences with. I keep coming back because the product is good. Um, you know, obviously, in this day and age, it's difficult to really um, dedicate yourself to the sacred knowledge the way you could back in the day with the whole nine to five grind family, uh, din dunya balance, right? Um, Al provides uh, a means to a healthy balance. Uh, he's from, uh, you know, that one. He's coming across the table. Hey, throw him something, throw him something. Right next to us. Oh, crap. <laughs> All right, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum wa salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Could, could you tell us your name? Yeah, my name is uh, Taki Wudu Alameen, a.k.a. John King. All right, so I met you in the prayer area, and could you tell us a little bit about what led you to being praying right there and meeting me? What, what was your story? How did you get there? Where did you come from? I've lived in very nice, upscale communities where there was no glass, no paper on the streets, not far from the the hood or the ghettos in which I come from. So, alhamdulillah, as someone who was unaware, uneducated, didn't know how to read until I was 27 years old and locked away in the penitentiaries and the hell holes of the United States, San Quentin, Soledad, Tracy, just to name of the few of the 40 prisons that here in California, uh, I started, I learned how to read. Was that was that in prison? I, in prison, I learned how to read. I didn't know how to read. You know, academically, I was not even. I don't know how I made it from the. Kindergarten to the tenth grade, while I dropped out. You made it all the way to tenth grade without learning. W without knowing how to read, effectively know how to read. Well, tell us a little bit about what was it like in prison. What was your, what was the point where you started to really like realize that you you liked Islam and you're kind of interested in it? How did that? What was that process like? Oh, uh, the first thing that really sparked my uh, intellect about Islam was when I heard the brother say, "Allahu Akbar, Allah." Akbar. And when I heard that, I never heard it before, and that caught my attention. I'm like, what the hell? What is that? Right? And so uh, uh, the brother said, hey, uh, soldier of Allah. And I said, man, I'm not joining your prison game, bro. I'm not joining your prison. I'm, I, I, I'm at the bottom of my, rock bottom of my life right now, and I'm on my way to prison, and I'm not joining your game. And he said, no, 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 soldier of Allah. No, 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 I don't mean that. I don't, calm down, bro. I said, look, bro. I have enough problems. I'm on. He said, no, let me invite you to come to Juma. Come to Juma. I said, Juma? 
You know, I never heard of it. He said, yeah, come and listen to the email. The email? What the email? The email, right? He said, brother, just come. He's like a pastor. He's going to share some information which is going to uplift you. And I said, well, what I got to lose? I'm in the cell. Have him lock my door. I'll come. So I went there, and then that's when I heard that. Line. And I, I was, I was like, oh, my God. And, you know, and in prison, you have to have this facade, you know, that um, you're, you got to be a man. You don't show no weakness. And, but I, when I heard the brother say, I swear to God, he was calling that down, and I'm telling you, I'm about to cry. And I, was, and I had to hold myself, and I, I wasn't about to let nobody see that weakness in me, right? But I'm telling you, that was a moment of clarity. That was um, uh, where the rubber meets the road, to say. And that's when I started to investigate more, and the brother would sit down with me every day, and he would read something out the Quran, and he would explain it to me. And he was like, in the email, when I went to listen to him, he was saying, brother, I don't care how you got here. He said, what I do care about is how you leave here. And that was like, because I was like saying all along, I'm not going to come out of here the same way I came in here. And whatever it is that got me here, I want to change it. And so when I, and I prayed to God and I said, I don't know if you Jesus, I don't know if you Jehovah, I don't know what you are or who they acknowledge. I just hope that you help me find my way. I used to be on the front line for Shaytan, and I was a coward, and I was a backbiter, and I was a womanizer, and I did everything that Shaytan suggested to me. And I even told Shaytan, don't even trip, I'll handle this one for you. You ain't even got to suggest it. I was crazy as a bag of ball headed chickens for real, okay? But today I know that I am in my right state of mind. Because I know that nothing out there, no drugs, no alcohol, nothing could fill that void that I got in my heart right now. That void that I have, that peace that I have knowing that I'm doing right and knowing that I'm praising Allah. And I hope that anybody can benefit from what I have to say right now. I hope that you listen to this. so far yet we can't comprehend how far Oregon is from this wonderful place. I don't want to go back and become a disgrace. <laughs> oh, Yo man, swamps right next to the ocean, man. Let's go check oh. out let's go check out the beach. All right. We're on the Pacific. This is right where we camped out. Ooh, look at the yacht. You slow down, slow down, slow down. Ooh, ooh. Stop, 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 stop. Elk, right in the center. You guys got anything to feed it? Elk, right there. <laughs> Get away, get away, get away. What the heck? <laughs> what are you guys doing in my place? <laughs> All right, guys, we're going through the tree.
Yo, both of you do it, both of you do it. Do the, do the boxing. Oh, that's so funny. And three, two, one, they go.